welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Mary Beth Gassman, and I am a professor at Rutgers University, and I also serve as the executive director of both the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice and the Center for Minority Serving Institutions. These entities are sponsoring today's webinar, and we are also funded by the Mellon Foundation. This webinar is part of a larger series called Let's Talk About the Humanities, where we are featuring faculty from across the country, from all different types of colleges and universities who are sharing their humanities-based research with us. And many of these individuals are from a program that we have called Hispanic Serving Institutions Pathways to the Professoriate, which is aimed at bringing more diversity, specifically in terms of Latinx uh, faculty, into the professoriate. And so we, we call upon many of the mentors in that program to showcase some of their new work. And so we are really, really excited today to have with us Dr. Aza Weersoli, who is a mentor in our um our Hispanic Serving Institutions Pathways to the Professoriate program, and also served in a leadership role in the program as well, and is just a really, really fantastic person to work with. I just wanted to say that personally. I'll give you a little bit of her bio before I hand things over to her. Aza, as we know her, is Jamaican-born, and she is the president of the Association of Caribbean Women Writers and Scholars, and the former coordinator, as I said, of the Hispanic Serving Institutions Pathways to the Professoriate Fellowship at Florida International University. She's also an associate professor of English and affiliate faculty in African and African, African Diaspora Studies in the Center for Women and Gender Studies and in the Latin American and Caribbean Center at Florida International. Um, she's an Andrew, Andrew W. Mellon and Citizen Scholar Fellow, and she's the author of Eroticism, Spirituality, and Resistance in Black Women's Writings, two poetry collections, which are First Rain and The Women Who Knew, and she's co-editor of the Caribbean Erotic, along with Opal Palmer Adisa, which features essays, fiction, and poetry from 62 writers from the English-speaking, Spanish-speaking, and French-speaking Caribbean. So please join me in uh, welcoming our guest speaker, who is going to be giving a talk called Self-Fashioning, Resistance, and Resilience, Lessons from Our Literary and Activist Foremothers. Please welcome Dr. Aza Weir Soli. Welcome, Aza. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. That was a wonderful introduction. I don't know if I deserve that. <laughs> you do. You but do. I'll take it. I will take it. <laughs> you do. And we can't wait to learn from you. I know that this is going to be amazing. So take it away. And um, I did want to say that we do have Natalie pass off on tech, and she is going to be here to help you with your slides. So take it away. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks so much, Natalie. You have been such a wonderful help with all of this. I also want to make it clear, because I don't think I put that in my bio, that I was in the first Mellon Minority Undergraduate Program cohort when it was still called Mellon Minority Undergraduate Program. I was in the first cohort. So I was a guinea pig. <laughs> and here I am, 30 odd years later, presented on this platform. And it gives me great pleasure to do anything for Mellon, because really and truly, it is because of Mellon why I ended up going into this career. You'll find out more about that later in my talk as well. So um, without further ado, I think we can begin with the slides. So of course, you know, the talk is called Self-Fashioning Resistance and Resilience, Lessons from Our Literary and Activist Foremothers. The first foremother I have here is Louise Bennett Coverley, um, called Miss Lou in Jamaica. She was born September 7th, 1919 and died July 26, 2006. Miss Lou is an iconic Jamaican poet. She's a folklorist. She's a writer. She's an educator, an essayist, a dramatist, an activist, a cultural critic, as well as a cultural ambassador. And she's beloved in Jamaica. Queen Elizabeth's recent death instantiated the occasion for me to have a visceral response to a song whose melody is seared into my psyche, although I never really knew the words. 
Jamaican school children were made to sing the British national anthem along with old Anglican hymns every Monday morning at devotion, at least in my school. Jamaica just celebrated its 60th anniversary of independence. So we were some years into our own fledgling nationhood um, because I was born after independence, but we were still singing God Save the Queen in school. Enter Miss Lou with pride in Jamaican culture. Louise Bennett represents an important break with that colonial legacy where English and all things English were revered while all things Jamaican were seen as inferior. This included the people, their language, their culture, and their customs. There is a Louise Bennett Memorial. Um, Louise Bennett is a household name in Jamaica, um, she, although she lived in Toronto, Canada for the last decade of her life. So a statue in her honor was recently erected in Gordontown, where Bennett lived most of her life in Jamaica. There's also a proposal afoot in Jamaica to make her a national heroine. Scholar and poet Mervyn Morris has done an incredible body of work on Louise Bennett. And he says she's the only poet who has really hit the truth about her society through its own language. And I think he's talking about in Jamaican society. She captures all the spontaneity of the expression of Jamaicans, Jamaicans joys and sorrows, their ready, poignant, and even wicked wit, their religion and their philosophy of life. And Professor Carolyn Cooper, um, also speaks to Louise Bennett's um, impact, and she's done a, an incredible body of work on Louise Bennett as well. She says, Louise Bennett's mission was essentially about Black power. And here she gives us a quote from Miss Lou. Bennett said, when I was a child, nearly everything was bad, you know? They would tell you, they would tell you, say, they would tell you, say, you have bad hair, that Black people bad, and that the language you talk was bad. And I know that a lot of people I knew were not bad at all. They were nice people and they talked this language. Professor Cooper continues, the lasting insult to Miss Lou is our continuing refusal to acknowledge the power of our Jamaican language. At home and in school, the Ministry of Education must ensure that every child is able to learn in his or her home language. It's a human right. That's one of the ways in which we will continue to honor Louise Bennett for generations to come. And while we're at it, we should, we should officially recognize the fact that Miss Lou is a national heroine. So the, 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 the activism to make that happen is happening on the ground in Jamaica as we speak. Poetry in Patwa. So writing poems in her native Jamaican tongue, originally called Patwa, but also called Creole, Jamaican Creole or Jamaican nation language, Bennett raised the dialect of the Jamaican folk to an art lip, to an art form, which is often celebrated by many in Jamaica today, although it was not accepted by the elite in her time. And it is still viewed as unacceptable in some sectors of Jamaican society. I wanna make it clear that it's not the official language. English is the official language. Unlike Haiti, where Creole is, is the official language in Haiti, Jamaica nation language, while accepted by most, is not an official language and it is not accepted by everyone. It still has a stigma attached to it by some sectors of the society. And that's why it's important to um, recognize um, Miss Lou's contributions um, in, 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 and, and, and to acknowledge her as someone who is an agent for Black power, as Carolyn Cooper puts it. I want to share with you a poem by Louise Bennett from the selected poems by Mervyn Morris, edited by Mervyn Morris. And this one is about women's liberation in Jamaica. Jamaica Oman. Jamaica Oman Conisa. Is how them channels saw. Look how long them liberated and the man them never know. Look how long Jamaica woman, mother, sister, wife, sweetheart, out a road and in a yard, they a dominate her part. From maroon nanny, take her body, bounce bullet back per man, to when nowadays girl picnicton spelling bee champion. From the grassroots to the hilltop, in profession, skill, and trade. Jamaica woman take her time, the mountain make the grade. Some back a man a push, some side a man a hold him hand. Some a lick sense in a man head, some a guide him, pan him plan. 
neck and neck and foot and foot with man, she buckle hold her own, while man a call her so sorib, woman a ton backbone. And long before woman lib broke out over foreign land, Jamaica female was a work, her liberated plan. So that's just a little bit. <laughs> of Louise Bennett's poetry. And I would love for you to go seek her out and, you know, enjoy. She's very witty as well. So I'd love for you to go seek her out and enjoy um, her work. It's, she has, um, there's a lot online now, as you know. So next frame, please. Miss Lou and early Jamaican theater. This is a clip by the National Library of Jamaica. Although she was born in, I mean, she lived in Spanish town and lived in Kingston most of her life. She spent the first 11 years of her life in St. Mary, where she was born in St. Mary. And look here, St. Mary, she never forgot the country. She lived in the country all her life. I always say to her, I say, you must have had a very happy childhood in the country. Because she tells you about the rivers, the birds, a lot of the things I know about the country. I used to hear from my mother long before I ever went. The first time I went to the country was when I was 10. Now, my father died when I was seven. And uh, my grandmother, who I loved very much, uh, Mimi, my mother's mother, she died when I was 10. And she was from St. Mary, of course. And she wanted to die in St. Mary. This is the sort of thing, you know. And uh, that was the first time after Mimi died that I know what a dinky mini was. When you get into those moods, you'll find that you will neither be unhappy or you wouldn't be happy because it takes happy and unhappy. So you see, oh, <laughs> how does that sound to you? Oh, it's naturally. Even from then you got, get on that, that this thing was not a very respectable thing, you know. If you were very respectable, you didn't have dinky minis, because this was, uh, those were the days when if you're black, you're bad, like. <laughs> and anything that was Jamaican was not too good, you know. And because I remember that um, uh, Mimi's uh, uh, brother, in whose house she died, you know, he wasn't too keen on this thing. And he said, well, not in his house, not in his yard, you know. So next door now, they, they, but they, 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 that didn't daunt anybody at all because it was, it, they, they, it was you know, just the, the, the next yard. The little people just down about them and them had a big dinky man. And this thing went on for eight nights. And this is supposed to cheer up the family of the dead. And the funny thing about it is that everybody went. Even Uncle Tom would not want it in his yard. What Bennett taught me, Bennett taught me self-acceptance and the dignity of the folk how the acceptance of one's own language, culture, and customs promotes self-love and initiates a process of healing from colonial traumas. Louise, um, corporal punishment in the Jamaican school system for speaking the Jamaican language was commonplace. It's certain, I certainly got spanked for speaking Jamaican Patois. And um, it was very disconcerting in addition to being abusive, it was disconcerting. It was disconcerting because, you know, we were raised in Jamaica to respect our elders and all of my elders spoke Jamaican Patois. So on the one hand, we're being told you should respect these people. They're taking care of you. These are your elders. This is our culture. You grow up with a culture of respect for the elderly and respect for anybody older than you. Everybody older than you is Miss and Mr. No, no calling anyone by first names, right? But yet, we're being told at the same time that the language they speak is somehow bad. It's a problem. It's inferior. So how are you supposed to respect these people 
when you're being told and you're actually being raised to think that you're better than them because now you're being raised to speak English. So there is this like internal, there's this cognitive dissonance that occurs as a result of that. So you go home and you're looking at the people around you with different eyes because they're supposed to have all the wisdom, but here you're being told, oh, they, maybe they're not so bright after all because they don't speak English, right? So um, that, that there was that, that, that was a problem that they somehow they didn't figure out that they needed to, to fix that. But Louise Bennett figured that out. And that's why I think that um, Carolyn Cooper aligns her with Black Pride. The only sanctioned way to speak Jamaican Patois was at school concerts when you could recite a Louise Bennett poem. And so I was a very avid performer as a little girl and I would perform Louise Bennett poems at church or school recitals. And that's the only way that it was acceptable to speak in Jamaican Patois is re reading her poetry. And I, I started doing that when I was really young. Um, I think before I was even eight. Bennett taught me how to value the Jamaican language and the people who spoke it. Bennett became a celebrity in Jamaica. She also became famous in diasporic spaces, Jamaican diasporic spaces, such as Jamaican communities in the UK, in Canada, and the USA. And so um, I grew, although I grew up being, you know, in being basically brainwashed into thinking that somehow if you spoke English, you were better, smarter, superior. I also had Bennett, who was a counter narrative, the voice of the counter narrative. And she taught me that that was not necessarily true, that these people who spoke Jamaican Creole were worthy, they were intelligent, they just spoke a different language. And all sociolinguists today would agree with that. But that's not what we were taught growing up. But I had to learn that. And the way I learned it was through Louise Bennett advocating for Jamaican culture, customs, and language, most importantly, right? Um, and so when I went to UC Berkeley and I was, you know, I had to pass two foreign languages to advance the candidacy. I did fine with Spanish since I'd taken Spanish since high school in Jamaica, but boy, did I struggle with French. And as I was struggling with French, I thought, why am I struggling through French or another foreign language when I'm, I'm not gonna use another foreign language? Um, for any of the books that, that I'm using. And, and, and I decided that I would do a chapter on Louise Bennett and then it just like a light bulb went off in my head. Why not petition Berkeley to use Jamaican Creole as one of my language requirements? Because there were Hispanic students around me who were one of their foreign languages was Spanish. So <laughs> I thought, well, if they can do that and they speak Spanish, why can't I use Jamaican Creole, which is a different language? Luckily for me, um, famous linguist John Walkwater had just come to UC Berkeley and it was very nice. Um, and so I made an appointment with him and he was very supportive. He wrote me an exam in either 18th or 19th century Jamaican Creole. I forget which one, but, um, but it was very old because I know it, it had like, it kind of looked like Middle English or, you know, um, some of that. And, I, and it looked very different from what Jamaican uh, Creole looks like today. But he sent me an exam in that and I passed it and was promoted to PhD candidacy. Bennett often told stories about the Ashanti folk, Anansi the spider, who though limited in physical strength and social status, used the power of his mind and spirit to overcome adversities and to triumph over worthy adversaries. In Jamaica, well, not everybody, but Jamaican intellectuals in particular call this skill Anansiism. And I misspelled it here. It's actually A-N-A-N-C-Y-I-S-M, Anansiism. Louise Bennett made use of her natural intellect, quick wit, charming nature, a megawatt smile, and the transformative power of language to transform the way our society saw itself. She vested me with the power to do the same. And so I pay homage to the indomitable spirit and resilience of Miss Lou. And the next um, foremother I want to talk about is Audre Lorde. A lot of this is going to be personal um, and none of the others are, but this one will be. So lessons from Audre Lorde, 1934 to 1992. She was a poet, an educator, an essayist, an activist, a self-described black lesbian mother and warrior. The ethics of difference, how accepting and celebrating difference is morally and ethically sound and promotes principles of humanism, diversity, justice, equity, 
and democracy. I landed at Hunter College in 1987 and was made acquainted with Audre Lorde through the Poetry Center that was named after her. I think it was named after her in 80, either 81 or 82, but I got to Hunter at 87. Through my work at the Poetry Center, I came to know Audre Lorde both personally and professionally. She encouraged me in my writing, told me that I had a strong, unique voice, and advised me to publish my poems. Many of those poems that were published, many of those poems are pub poems that were that she saw are poems that were published in my poetry collection, First Rain. Audrey's impact on my life. Audrey encouraged me to go to Berkeley to work on my PhD. I badly wanted to apply to the Iowa Writers Workshop, but I was a fellow in the Mel Mellon Minority Undergraduate Program, as Mirabet told you earlier, uh, my last two years at Hunter. And Mellon was not paying for an MFA degree. I had to do a PhD. And so um, that's how I ended up um, at Berkeley doing the PhD. Next frame, please. Finding new mentors. Audrey cautioned me that graduate school could be a very alienating experience, especially if you were far away from home. She said, I wanted to go to Berkeley, right? I wanted to go to Berkeley because of its reputation. She said, the reputation of the school will not matter if you never graduate from the program. You have to go somewhere where you will have, where you'll find the people who will help you to make it to the finish line. So she told me to look for Barbara Christian, who is this lovely woman on the screen, was one of my mentors, Professor Barbara Christian. And she told me to look for June Jordan, those two. I found um, Opal Palmer Adisa on my own, was also an incredible, incredible mentor as well. Um, but Christian was especially instrumental in my journey at UC Berkeley. Um, and when Christian passed away, um, right before I finished the dissertation, Christian passed away in 2000, and Opal Palmer Adisa became my dissertation director. But Christian was supposed to be my dissertation director. My dissertation, my original dissertation director had actually um, gotten a job and moved on. She was no longer at Berkeley and therefore no longer um, directing my dissertation. And Barbara quickly stepped in and took it over. But because Barbara passed away, Opal ended up finishing the job for her. They were also very good friends and colleagues. Um, and so um, she's one of the mentors that Lord introduced me to by telling me, go, go to Berkeley before you accept, um, go out and, you know, accept, um, um, before you accept their offer, you know, because I, I had a full Mellon fellowship, a graduate Mellon fellowship. And before I accepted their offer, she advised me um, to go to UC Berkeley and to meet Barbara and June. And that's what I did. And that's why Barbara is here. She ended up being an incredible mentor, um, both personally and professionally for me. Um, next frame, please. So Lord's impact on my works. In my scholarly book, Eroticism, Spirituality and Resistance in Black Women's Writings, I discuss the ways in which African spiritual practices such as Yerba, Vodun, Condomble and Santeria allow for the synthesis of the sexual and the spiritual that Lord discusses in her essay, The Uses of the Erotic, the Erotic as Power. Similarly, in the anthology I co-edited with Opal Palma Adisa, Caribbean Erotic, I made a conscious decision to use Lord's definition of the erotic when we sent out the call for submissions. In order to avoid a glut of submissions that bordered on the pornographic, we made it clear that we wanted to use Lord's model of the erotic as our guide. Primarily, we were not, we were, we were trying to make sure we didn't get a lot of, of um, pieces that, that objectified women. And so this is a framework we used. The erotic is a measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and the chaos of our strongest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we've experienced it, we know we can aspire. For having experienced the fullness of this depth of feeling and recognizing its power in honor and self-respect, we can require no less of ourselves. Right, so that's from Sister Outsider, and that's the framework we used. Lord's influence on my identity. More than anything else, it is Lord's determination to honor and celebrate difference as a source of information, agency, and empowerment that has had the greatest impact upon my moral and political development. Indifference and Survival, an address at Hunter College published in I Am Your Sister, Lord says, in a profit economy, which needs groups of outsiders as surplus people 
we are programmed to respond to difference in one of three ways. By ignore, to ignore it by denying the testament of our own senses. Oh, I never even noticed you were different. Or if that is not possible, then we try to neutralize it in one of two ways. If the difference has been defined for us in our introductory courses as good, meaning useful in preserving the status quo, in perpetuating the myth of sameness, then we try to copy it. If the difference is defined as bad, that is revolutionary or threatening, then we try to destroy it. But we have few patterns for relating across differences as equals. And unclaimed, our differences are used against us in the service of separation and confusion, for we view them only in opposition to each other, dominant slash subordinate, good slash bad, superior slash inferior. And of course, so long as the existence of human differences means one must be inferior, the recognition of those differences will be fraught with guilt and danger. And certainly, there are very real differences between us of race, sex, age, sexuality, class, vision. But it is not the differences between us that tear us apart, destroying the commonalities we share. Rather, it is our refusal to examine the distortions which arise from the misnaming and from the illeg illegitimate usage of those differences, which can be made when we do not claim them nor define them for ourselves. The moral necessity of allyship. In the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Lord says that difference must not be tolerated, but seen as a fund of necessary polarities between which our creativity can spark like a dialectic. Only then does the necessity for interdependency become unthreatening. This is a framework that I use for understanding the ethical and moral necessity of allyship, collaboration, and community building, even in the midst of threats to long cherished ideas about democracy, humanism, equity, fairness, and justice. Sojourner Truth is my third and final for mother. Lessons from Sojourner Truth, who lived from 1797 to 1883. Truth is, Sojourner was a mystic and a sage, consorting with Mama Bet's God in the sky. One by one, she stacked her pain, her losses, and her many traumas into a stairway to heaven to wrestle that power the world told her was not her birthright and made a liar out of men, gods, and devils. Truth is, Sojourner was a natural mystic. What I learned from Sojourner Truth. From Sojourner Truth, I learned the courage to reinvent the self. Sojourner knew how to draw on spiritual powers and the supernatural when our own flesh was just not enough to withstand the pain of man's inhumanity to man and woman. Supernatural and divine elevation of the ruined self to a state of grace, goodness, and empowerment is part of the legacy she bequeathed me and other survivors of trauma. And some questions from Barbara Christian that are pertinent to Sojourner's journey. In the race for theory, Barbara Christian champions Black women's creatively theorizing in narrative forms, in the stories we create, in riddles and proverbs, in the play with language, because dynamic rather than fixed ideas seem more to our liking. I want us to think about the ways in which Sojourner Truth self-representation extends that idea and challenges us to see her the way she wanted to be seen and read based on the record she left for us. Sojourner called herself a self-made woman and other critics argue that indeed she, she created an image that at times runs counter to those ideas, to their ideas of who she was historically. The growth of Sojourner Truth. How Sojourner Truth grew from object to subject is instructive. Sojourner tells her amanuensis, Olive Gilbert, that she once denied food to her children in order to obey the dictates of her master against stealing. And she prided herself on the fact that the fruits of her womb added to his acquisition of property, privilege, and power. Gilbert suggests that Sojourner told this story with some level of shame, chastising her former self for being naive and brainwashed. The power of self-naming. So from whence came this dramatic turnaround from pitiful object to iconic subject? 
We can look to Isabella's conversion experiences for the answer. Imani Perry, who did the second edition of Narrative of Sojourner Truth, um, says, we can look to Isabella's conversion experiences. She says that there were two conversion experiences. The first is Sojourner's conversion experience that was religious. Her first one was her religious conversion. And the second was her change of name and identity from Isabella Bromfrey to Sojourner Truth. Truth's altar in the outdoors is a place of natural beauty, serenity, privacy, and peace, much like Baby Sugg's altar in the clearing in Toni Morrison's Beloved. Over time, this syncretic, fragmented, experimental, but powerful sense of spiritual agency came to inform Sojourner Truth's foundational wheelhouse of spirituality, birthed and augmented her strong sense of self and developed a powerful new identity for her, one she used to reinvent herself, fashion the Sojourner self in opposition to the no self that slave inculcated since birth. When Truth was accused of criminal behavior by the Folgers, and she was subsequently, subsequently found innocent, she filed a lawsuit against them for slander and won, restoring her good name. Imani Perry states that Truth saw her name as something she owned and could protect against desecration by others, even those who were white and wealthy. Her, in, her investment in her reputation at a time when Black people were routinely subjected as an entire group to racist stereotypes that obviated any notion of a good name is almost unbelievable. Sojourner Truth's activism. From that point forward, Sojourner Truth's life became a catalog of heroic acts. She petitioned Congress for land for free Blacks. She made friends with famous people all across the nation. She became the spokesperson for many of the utopian communities she joined. She preached and taught the word of God based upon her own understanding of the relationship between righteousness, justice, and equality, always combining her religion with her politics, her preaching and teachings to her quest for race and gender liberation. The foremother of Black feminism, Perry also asserts that Truth's articulation of her rights through motherhood makes it undeniable that she should be designated as one of the foremothers of Black feminism. Indeed, Sojourner's first recorded act of heroism is her pursuit of a lawsuit to return her son Peter from Southern slavery. She won this suit against overwhelming odds. In response to her slave missus, mistress, Mrs. Dumont, who told her she had no means of retrieving her son from the South, Sojourner states, I have no money, but God has enough or what's better, and I'll have my child again. She continues, oh my God, I know I'd have him again. I was sure God would help me to get him. Why I felt so tall with him? I felt as if the power of a nation was with me. Although Sojourner and Christianity. Although no were Blacks no doubt practice aspects of African religion, and we have ample proof of that, Christianity is a religion our foremothers who left written records tend to lay claim to. We can argue trenchantly and persuasively for the reasons they may have chosen to omit African beliefs and practices from their oral and written testimonies. Our foremothers appropriated the best aspects of Christian doctrine in service to their liberation from chattel slavery, patriarchal domination, and Black self erasure. Not only did Black women like Sojourner Truth, Jarena Lee, Maria Stewart, Old Elizabeth, and other Black and female itinerant preachers of that era assert that they spoke and taught and lectured and fought and led, not by man's authority, but by God's but they also insisted that they did not need permission from men or from white society. Their mystical conversion experiences never occur in church, but at home or in the outdoors. Yet their conceptualization of God is always augmented by select biblical teachings, whether or not they knew how to read and write. Sojourner, Sojourner Truth and her relationship with God. Once converted, some said about preaching and teaching from scripture and in Sojourner's case, from how she understands God based on her own relationship and from how she interprets what has been read to her, because, you know, she was illiterate, as well as from her own reflections and moral convictions. Theirs was a personal, was a spiritual assignment by divine order, and it allowed them freedom to travel, respite from menial and domestic labor, acclaim and esteem from many who heard them speak and significantly gained them acolytes, 
followers, fans, and mentees. The power these spiritual warriors claimed was as extraordinary as the impact they received in their lifetime and their continued impact in our time. Sojourner and Black Feminism. Many claim Sojourner Truth as a foremother of Black feminism. She's also the foremother of the civil rights movement. She petitioned against segregated streetcars in DC after the Civil War and won. Truth is also foremother of the reparations movement, having petitioned Congress for land out west for free Blacks in DC who were poverty stricken and, suf stricken and suffering after the Civil War. She may also be the foremother of the queer clapback. I say this because in the 1858 anti-slavery meeting in Indiana, pro-slavery Democrats challenged Truth's identity as a woman and misgendered her. They tried to shame her by demanding that she bare her breasts to prove she was a woman. Sojourner subverted the shame tactic by telling them the shame was theirs, not hers. Their shaming tactics were based on respectability and conventions of female propriety. And so she did bear her breasts. And by doing so, she flaunted um, both um, respectability politics and the conventions of female propriety. And then she issued her own counter challenges to these men who were trying to insult her. She says to, to, to them that her breasts had suckled white babies who had, grew, who, had grew, um, who had grown to be better men than her detractors were. And she asked them if they wanted to come and suck too so they could become better men. Queering of Black womanhood. Not only was she assumed to be a man by white men at the Women's Rights Convention, but Truth was sexually assaulted by white women, according to Imani Penny, Perry, rather, Imani Perry, um, who wrote the introduction to the 2005 edition of Narrative of Sojourner Truth. If these allegations are true, they may serve to show that Sojourner's sexual abuse was from both men and women and that she was involved in queer communities or queer spaces in her activist work, which were not immune from the vices of the larger community. This information is both disturbing, the fact that she was um, um, sexually molested in, in some of these spaces, as well as enlightening. Whether queer or not, it may suggest that Sojourner was comfortable in and accepting of queer spaces, but also that these spaces did not protect her from forms of abuse she endured under slavery. Sojourner Truth's self-fashion is as self-protection and self-ownership. The complexities of Truth's queering and its imbrication with forms of abuse, denial and subordination are yet other pieces of her life that will remain unknown to us. Clearly, she desired to keep pieces of herself to herself, but, it is, from, but is it from shame, from self-protection, or from a desire to claim ownership over her image and legacy? What she left with us was the art of paintings and photography, letter writing, friendships, lectures, the impact she made on the world about her, as well as her, her um, biography, which Imani Perry says could be been in between an autobiography and a biography because Olive Gilbert wrote it and, and Truth could not read or write. So we don't know how much of it Truth probably would have edited if she, you know, if, if she were capable of doing so. So, so Imani says this kind of falls in that in between space between biography and autobiography. I think that's an interesting way of framing it. Meeting President Lincoln. Some critics state that Truth represented her meeting with President Lincoln more favor favorably than it actually went. Imani Perez argued that it is because Truth recognized that she spoke for the Black race. The cause needed Lincoln, a president, to be remembered as humane or had, as being humane to an illiterate Black woman so they might continue to hope and to hold dear the promises of reconstruction. And critic Augusta Robark argues that truth allows some depictions to stand because she found them useful in her self-fashioning. Robark points to truth's favorite picture, which is constructed to preserve an image of womanhood that was consistent with the conventions of femininity of that era. Perry and Robach comment about the frequency with which Sojourner had herself photographed and her intentionality in the construction of these images. Perry insightfully asserts that Truth was not just arguing for the recognition of her womanhood, but also for her unrecognized beauty. Sojourner Truth, Audre Lorde, and Jamaican Creole poet Louise Bennett all resisted attempts of the dominant culture to define and limit their selfhood 
and found ways to extend their influence beyond the limitations of race, gender, color, sexuality, culture, class, and religion. Their creative and scholarly work and activism have shaped my identity as a poet, scholar, mother, mentor, professor, with a commitment to equity, justice, autonomy, and creative exploration of the self under construction. I learned from them how to navigate the pitfalls of social and economic mobility without losing my core values of justice and equality, my allegiance to the folk or my pride in where I am from and my appreciation for those who helped me on my journey. This talk is not long enough to allow me to honor all the women whose influences have shaped my life in indelible and transformative ways. But whatever I have of resilience, I learned from my grandmother, my mother, her sisters, and these other mother figures whose lives and works I have studied in my journey to heal from deep and malign historical and personal traumas. I am a triumphant survivor because they were, and because they left instructional manuals through their lives and works, even when they kept certain things to themselves to, to preserve their dignity and self-respect. The only way I can repay the debt I owe them is by doing my work of organizing, educating, mentoring, research, writing, and publishing at a pace that serves my need for balance, autonomy, respite, and healing. Lord, ask in the transformation of silence into language and action, because I am woman, because I am Black, because I am lesbian, because I am myself, a Black woman, warrior, poet, doing my work, coming to ask you, are you doing yours? I can truly answer, yes, I am doing my work in my way, by my rules, just like you taught me. Kalalu for Audrey. From you, I learned that a love that risked nothing wasn't worth the having. There's a peach from Myrna nestled in tissue paper in my handbag, while a tender-hearted Trini makes you Kalalu and crab in my cozy Harlem kitchenette. The aroma of hot peppers, spinach, and okra simmered down with crab legs and oysters will make Lenox Hill Hospital smell like glorious kitchen in St. Croix. I wasn't prepared for the look of acceptance, but your indignation over losing your locks lit that old spark that was surely you, Audrey. My gifts of Oshun, my gifts to Oshun couldn't save you, but the blessing of your hand on my early glowing has brightened into a 12 year old beauty of a boy who makes the question you used to ask me, how will you use it? The defining query of the spirit charted journey. Um, thank you so, so much. That was absolutely stunningly beautiful. And I just feel like um, I got to learn so much and I learned so much about you too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we are open up for questions. I have a couple already. I wanted to start with one and please, please. Uh, we have, you know, we have lots of time for questions and you have this amazing, amazing woman and um, intellectual and storyteller and poet and you know so 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 much so please send your questions in here's the first one um okay. how would teaching about the complexity of these black women change our understanding of history if if it were taught in in uh public schools if it were taught in college history courses not just maybe within you know African and African American studies, but just more generally, because it's obvious that it can be right. So the question is, how would it change our understanding and richness, like the richness of the history that we know? I think one of the things from a personal perspective, I, I think one of the things it would do, particularly if you teach them together, because there's, there's a way in which we, because we're intellectuals, we're in the academy. So of course we value knowledge. But what kind of knowledge do we value? I think it would give students a, a framework to understand other epistemologies, 
other ways of knowing, spiritual ways of knowing, intuitive ways of knowing. If you teach about Sojourner Truth and how brilliant she was, I think it would help students to understand intuitive ways of knowledge. And think about students who, are, who may have some, um, some, some, I'm struggling to find the word, but I'm thinking of students who are dyslexic or, or like my son, right? Students who have other ways of, of learning, students who do not learn in the traditional ways or who need some assistance um, with, with traditional, you know, um, knowledge um, production, right? If you, if you would present this information to them in a way that allows them to know that they're already smart, that, that everything they that who they are is already enough to learn what they need to learn to survive in the society. I think it would help them not just in terms of how they operate within the classroom, but in terms of, of how good they feel about themselves, how they feel about themselves and how they are able to then navigate a society that maybe isn't necessarily created for them, created to deal with some of the issues that they may have, some of the challenges that they may face. Right. And I think it also you you would also privilege other forms of knowledge besides just book knowledge and, and help students to understand that there are other ways of knowing and that they, they you know, that they, they have a, a, a bigger pool to draw from. It would also kind of be a corrective for some of the misinformation that's already out there or some of the lack of information, because what my students tell me when they get to FIU is we, we didn't learn any of this. How come we didn't know about this? We weren't taught any of this. We we're taught a little bit about slavery, but it was so surface level that we really don't know much. You know, so when I teach the slave narratives courses, and I, I really champion um, Sojourner Truth in that course, even though she didn't write her own book, but I champion, because I come from a storytelling tradition, I know the importance of storytelling. And what she did was she told her story to someone who could write. So the person could write it down. And I, I know that Olive Gilbert could not have written such an amazing story if Sojourner Truth had not already been an amazing storyteller. And we have all of this information from history to let us know what an incredible speaker she was, what an amazing storyteller she was. And so though, you know, though Gilbert might have framed things, you know, a particular way that maybe the truth might not have agreed with everything the way Gilbert framed it, but I think enough of it, enough of the truth of it got on the page. Right. I think she was a good ally to her. Was she perfect? Probably not. But I think she was a good enough ally to her. And she she actually was a mentee, you know, of, of Sojourner Truths. Right. So some of the letters you see, you can see that she really looked up to her. Right. That um, whatever she presented to us, at least I think most of it. Right. Can be taken at face value, if not not all of it, but most of it can be taken at face value. And so, you know, that Sojourner Truth was an amazing storyteller. Uh, Gilbert is not, doesn't have a good enough imagination to come up with all of that on her own because it, it's, it's Sojourner's life, you know, and she talked about it elsewhere as well. So she has letters, there are letters written to her as well, uh, people who know her, who have had conversations with her. And, and that's also published in the second edition, um, the book of, oh, Amani Perry talks about it. So she mm -hmm. has, she has a, 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 another collection that came out for her. I'll find it in a minute. That is, it, it's, Imani's, it's in the fifth edition by Amani Perry. Right, she has those those letters are in that edition. I'll find out the name, um, what it's called in a minute. I'm it's, it's slipping my mind at the moment. But yeah, you know, so I I, I think that it, it's really important to teach this so that we can it, students will have a broader view. Same with Louise Bennett. Same with with Audre Lorde. Now Audre Lorde is it's much more accessible and more much more known today. She's all over Twitter. She's everywhere now, right? But I think the same applies that that Lord. But also to kind of um, apply Lord to today's politics as well. Because for me, it was more than just about what I learned from her essay was not just what I learned intellectually. It was also what I learned about life, was also what I learned about politics, was also what I learned about community building. It was also what I learned about, um, to some extent, forgiveness, right? To, you know, recognizing that sometimes people don't understand difference or they think that the only way to succeed is to use your difference against you. And mm -hmm. so maybe you have to have what they call those, those um, courageous conversations, right, with them, that sometimes that is called for. But that allyship, while not perfect, is important and necessary. So, you know, there, there are ways in which Lord is being used now that's the, the certainly um, very effective, and, and we should do more of that. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we got a really nice comment here. Um, says, hi, Professor. It's Dakota. 
I just wanted to say how incredible this presentation was and how much I love and how much I learned from you. I just wanted to shower you with flowers and love. I know that's not a question, but I just thought I would send that your way because it's such a lovely thing. Thank you, Dakota. Um, You're always trying to get me to cry. I'm not crying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so we have some more questions. Um, and I just want you to know that Dakota wanted you to know it's called the Book of Life. The other collection is from Truth. So thank you did. so much, Dakota. You see why I love my students, the Book of Truth. I couldn't remember the name of it. I love that. I love that. I love having, I love young people around me. They, their I memories know. work so Help. much better. Help in real time, right? That exactly. was exactly love it. I love okay. it. Thank you. <laughs> so um, we do. So we have a couple, a bunch more questions coming in, but we have another um, person that just wanted to say that was amazing, such a brilliant presentation, and for the thanks for this homage to your brilliant foremothers and mentors, um, and um, and the question that they have is, can you share advice? about how we could incorporate spirituality and eroticism as an integral component of our classroom pedagogy. How can we incorporate spirituality and eroticism yes. as an important part of our classroom pedagogy? What a great question. <laughs> um, one of the ways we can do that is certainly to teach Audre Lord and especially the uses of the erotic the erotic as power, but also to teach Sojourner truth and to and to be open to spirituality. I guess that is that is I really want to say that that as intellectuals we have a tendency to kind of steer away from spirituality. But I think it's really important to if if you know I'm not saying you should go preach into your class. That's not what I mean. But that you should be open to at least teaching the work of people like Jarena Lee, right, and Sojourner Truth, people who say, look. This is what got me through. My faith got me through. Because sometimes I see things happening with young people and they need faith. They need faith. They need to believe in a higher power. They need to believe in something out there that loves them, you know, greater than they may even love themselves in the moment. Something more powerful than themselves. Something more powerful than any human who may, or humans who may be oppressing them. I know that got me through. You know, and I think that that you don't have to indoctrinate people into your belief system to do that. You can talk to them about what got you through, but you can but you can do so through the works. You don't even have to say you personally, but you can use the works that I've suggested and others, Jarena Lee's work, you know, Maria Stewart's work, use those works to show them. Because I say to my students all the time, look at what these people went through. What got them through? Yeah. Show me what got them through. Show me what it says in the text. Community, family, love, spirituality, faith. Wasn't money. Wasn't right. power. Right. Wasn't privilege. Wasn't the latest, you know, TikTok thing, you know, <laughs> whatever is going on. Yeah. You know? It was something deeper than that. Something money can't buy. Something you don't need to be pretty for. You know what I mean? Something you don't need to be thin for. Thank and they you. respond. Yeah. Young people respond to that because they're searching for something. Mm -hmm. So I think introduce them to the work and let the work speak for itself. I love that. Thank you. Many yeah. people don't think about Lord as a very spiritual person, but I, I find her to be extremely spiritual. Well, we have a whole bunch more questions, Aza, so I hope you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here comes another one. I mean, we got a lot of them, so I'm hoping we, I think we have time to get to all these too. Okay, here's one. Congrats to Aza for a brilliant presentation. Can you expand or expound on what Audrey says about doing your work and the different types of work that women do that might prevent them from doing their real work, especially in the academy with its prescribed work production? How do women in that space get to find and do their work with, with um, these impositions? That's a great question, huh? It is a great question. And I just checked the Q&A and it is from my, 
It is from um, Opal Palma Adisa, who I just told you all was one of my mentors and my dissertation director, <laughs> and she took over from, <laughs> from Barbara Christian. So she's scaring me with this question because nobody knows the answer to that better than Opal, <laughs> who is one of the most prolific writers and, and, and um, uh, activists that I have ever known, you know, in real life, right, in real time. So Opal, I think that Audre Lorde definitely speaks to the fact that we need to do the work that, that sustains us and we need to also rest when we must, right? Do the work that sustain us, rest when we must. One of the things she always asked me as I read in that poem is how will you use it? You know, she didn't allow me to kind of gush over her. You know, Audrey, you're so wonderful. She'd be, uh-huh, but how will you use it? <laughs> And I always thought, well, gee, I don't know. <laughs> and it's taken me this long to figure it out, right? That one of the ways that I can use it is to teach folks about her work, to teach folks about those um, Opal's work, to teach folks about Barbara Christian, to teach this, my students about these foremothers and these current mothers who are still here with us doing the work. But I think that we have to practice self-care. And that is something that comes across very clearly in the cancer journals in particular, the importance of self-care, but also the importance of doing work that feeds your soul, feeds your spirit and your soul, because that kind of work doesn't deplete you in the way that producing for the sake of producing or producing for the sake of advancing in the academy or advancing on the job might deplete you and wear you out and turn you into you know, somebody you don't even recognize and maybe don't want to be, some competitive, nasty person <laughs> that you may not even want to be, that you do, you choose the work that you do. And you do the work that feeds your spirit, that sustains you. You know, and that your, your, your purpose is also your work. Find it. Focus on that. Mm. And, 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 and it can't be because you're looking for validation from, from outside. It has to be because you're, 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 you're trying to make sure, especially in the cancer journals where Lord was very aware of her mortality. And she wanted to make sure that the words that she had to speak, she left them with us. She mm -hmm. didn't keep them bottled up inside of her, that she shared them with us. And she says, you speak even when you're afraid. You speak anyway. Mm -hmm. Your silence will not protect you. And the words that you, that you need to speak, you have those words inside of you. So it's really a way of turning inside, you know, recognizing that you have the power within you, that there's a difference between power over and empowerment. Mm -hmm. That personal power is different from hegemony. Control over other people, control over, over, over institutions is different from personal power. Having the, the power to heal yourself from trauma. Having the power to give somebody else, you know, a sense of, help somebody else to, to, to grow their own self-awareness. That, that is something we have inside of us and we can pull from that. And that the work that we're doing, the work that we want to leave, leave, leave behind us should be the work that we're doing because it, it feeds our purpose, but it also helps to sustain us. It helps us to teach. It, it leaves lessons for the next generation, just like these people that I've talked about, these women that I've talked about today. I mean, they are, their impact and influence and yours as well, Opal, is indelibly stamped in my consciousness, you know, and, and, and in my identity, help to shape my identity in ways that, that I, I, I can't even articulate fully because there are so many things, there are so many traumas that I carry with me that I have been able to heal or I'm in the process of healing, some of them still in the process, right? Of healing because of these examples, because I look back on their lives and I say, no, I can do this. It has been done. It has been done because they did it and also because they told me that I can do this. They left those lessons for me. And so our work is not about, you know, I remember um, arguing with my mom about, oh, my work is not about keeping the house clean. <laughs> my work is not about, I love to cook, but that's not my work. 
I don't define myself as a woman in that way because those are not the things that people remember when you're no longer here. Mm -hmm. Maybe your children will remember that. And you know, and if you were feeding the community, the community will remember that. But if you weren't feeding the community, only your children, you know, and the people around you will remember whether you were a good cook or whether you kept a good house. And nobody will care about whether you kept a good house. <laughs> they won't be reading that in your eulogy. I've never heard anybody read that in a eulogy. But Jamaican womanhood sometimes is predicated on that. Can you know, are you a good housekeeper? I remember arguing with my mom about that. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares <laughs> at the end of the day. Maybe you care, but nobody else cares. You know, I am doing the work that I came here to do. Now it's about knowing who you are, what you came here to do and going about doing it. But also knowing when you need to rest from it. Yeah. Because you're not feeling good. Because you need to heal in a physical way or in a, a mental way or, you know, psychologically and resting. Rest when you must, but don't give up. So resilience is part of the lesson they taught me. You know. But self care as well, mm -hmm. and 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 the um, sisterhood, brotherhood, community. Audre Lord says, "Without community, there is no liberation." And she gives a powerful testimony in the cancer journals about how the women's community saved her. And I can testify to the fact that when I went to Hunter, the women's community at Hunter saved this little young girl who was broken in so many ways, as well the community, the women's community I found at Hunter College, including Myrna Bain and Melinda Goodman, Asha Bandele, Dorothea Smart, Cheryl Boyce Taylor, all these women who were in and around the Audre Lord Women's Poetry Center saved me when I went to Hunter and my Hunter professors as well. So um, I'm a testament to that. And when she talked about it in Sister, in Sister Outsider, I tried to explain that to my students and I found myself struggling to explain it because it, it's, 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 it's not something that you can explain, mm -hmm. but it's something that you feel. It's a kind of love and support that I'm so glad that I was around these women. And maybe because I was younger or maybe because, you know, I was a little bit, you know, a little, a little bit ditzy. <laughs> so they kind of saw me, they kind of saw me as a, a little sister that they kind of took under their wings. And so the, the, the kind of competition that exists between women, I, I didn't see that, that often exists between women that I see a lot in heterosexual communities. I didn't see it in that community. I'm not trying to put the um, women's community or the, the lesbian community on a pedestal. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say, that the way they treated me with sisterhood, with, with motherly nurturing and guidance was something that saved me. Mm -hmm. And so when she talks about it in the cancer journals, I knew what she was talking about because I experienced that. Yeah. And it was very hard to explain it to someone else, to, to my students. I tried, but it was very hard because I felt like I, I couldn't quite explain it. I just know I felt it and I know it saved me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question we have uh, from Lynn, uh, amazing talk. Uh, there are a couple questions here. How does the process of self-fashioning mm -hmm. and self-actualization in your life show up in your poetry and theoretical work? And the second part of the question is we tell ourselves stories to survive but eventually certain stories no longer serve us as we evolve. What stories have you stopped telling yourself and what stories did you replace with them with? So self-fashioning and self-actualization showed up in this theoretical talk, Saniora, <laughs> because when I was asked to do this talk, I thought, how can I best serve the needs that I have currently? And my needs, the needs, the writing needs I have currently were to focus on, um, I was focusing in the moment when Mary Beth asked me to do the talk. I was focusing on, I had just done a piece on Bennett. I was focusing on a piece for Sojourner Truth for Cornell University for the theoretical symposium. And I'm always teaching Audre Lorde. So I wasn't doing a piece on Lord, but I always teach Lord. And I thought, how can I, how can I um, get my students to understand or get this audience to understand that these foremothers are 
can be can, the, the knowledge that they had, what they left us, can be can be called for current scholarship, and can be used to kind of motivate and mentor, right? the next generation. And that's why I came up with this because I thought, well, how did they help me? How can I get them to help others? And so I, 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 they always show up in my theoretical work, like Lord showed up. My scholarly book, Eroticism, Spirituality and Resistance in Black Women's Writings. I also did, wrote essays, published essay on, on her work. Um, it also shows up in pieces, like I did a piece on, on, um, on farming of bones and and I use eroticism spirituality and resistance in that so it's like I decided that I would fashion my work from the theories I got from Lord you know mm -hmm. so that I I feel like somebody told me that that a Lord was a kind of ur text right a brilliant critic said that Lord was Lord's uses of the erotic eroticism um as power was a kind of ur text for my scholarly work. And I thought, hmm, interesting. I didn't think about it that way. But when she said it, 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 it sparked something in me because when Opal and I were doing our collection, right, um, which is in Spanish, English, French, Creole, um, you, um, Caribbean erotic, when we were doing that edited collection, that's where the idea came from. It's like, well, if I can use it as an urtex, I can use it again to frame the pieces we want to come in so we don't end up with a bunch of pornography because the minute you use erotic in the title, people are going to misunderstand what you mean. And so that's how it showed up. It showed up in two works, right? The self-fashioning. That to me is self-fashioning. It's self-fashioning based on and, and self-actualization because these, these works are, you know, what helped me to make my bread and butter. It's also helped me to get tenure and all of that, right? Um, and so the next question is, we tell ourselves stories to survive, but eventually certain stories no longer serve us as we evolve. What stories have you stopped telling yourself and what stories did you replace them with? I love that question because one of the stories I stopped telling myself and the reason why I put all these books up here is because I'm always telling myself that I haven't done enough. I need to do more. You know, some writers are so prolific and they have a book out every year. And I'm like, I'm not one of them. I have four books. You know, and I don't have, I'm not where I want to be. And so I'm always, that's the story I'm always telling myself. And so what I tell my, that's why I put the books up here. You are where you are, mm -hmm. you know, you're where you need to be and that's okay. So I've stopped telling myself the story that I'm not good enough. I haven't accomplished enough. Right. Um, I need to do more. I'm glad but you I, stopped telling yourself that. <laughs> <laughs> you know and so yes of course I still have more work to do and I am doing my work so what I tell myself you know I am in the process of becoming I am still becoming that's why I love what Michelle how Michelle Obama named her her um biography her biography becoming I love that I am in the process of becoming I am still evolving I am still doing I am still becoming I am still working rather than I have not done enough what is wrong with me you know, and not seeing myself as a deficit or at a deficit, mm -hmm. but seeing myself as productive and even seeing the fact that I'm surviving, you know, that I have survived and I have survived so many traumas. I see that as a part of my life's work. I am doing my life's work. My life's work is to make sure that I am healed, that I am here, mm -hmm. that I continue to do my work for as long as there's breath in my body. That's my life's work. That's part of my life's work. It's not about just the books. Right. Or the talks or the name recognition or the following on social media. Mm. It's about my survival. It's about loving, creating community. Many, so many of you in the chat are part of my community that I have created. That's a part of my work, creating and sustaining those communities. That's a part of the work, which is part of answering Opal's question as well. It's part of pr providing and sustaining and creating and nurturing community is part of the work because without community, there is no liberation. We can't do, we don't do it in isolation. And Lord always talks about interdependence or interdependency. 
she says this idea of independence, it's, it's a lie. We don't do anything by ourselves. We need each other in order to survive. And we all have different strengths. We bring those different strengths. When we bring those strengths to the table, when we understand difference as information, we can't fix it if we don't know what each of us needs. And all of our needs are not the same. And it doesn't mean that you're going to have a utopia. It means you work at it. And that's okay. Sometimes just acknowledging the other person's problems or challenges is enough because you're seeing them. You're hearing them. They need, people need to be seen and heard. That's important, even if you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. But stay in the process. Respect the process. Do the work. Continue to do the work. And when you're done, when your time is done, pass the baton to someone else. Mm -hmm. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got time for about one more question. And I did want to read one of the comments too. I'm so thrilled to have been able to listen and learn today. Such an inspiring and an energizing presentation and discussion. Thank you. Um, also, just a moment of praise for you. Um, so this is such a relatable and authentic model of self-fashioning resistance and resilience for all of us. Just wanted to say that. And just people saying they love the presentation. Um, uh, it's answered so many questions for them and, um, and just, you know, helps to continue so people can move forward. And I guess the last question is, um, I think this is such a great question, which is what would you advise, what advice would you give to a Caribbean PhD student who's struggling to find written evidence of our ancestors when the colonial archive does not center our ancestors? What a great question. Tajila, you may have to speak to some of your family and, and to the, you know, um, the um, wider community, especially older people in that community, because all of it is not written, um, especially in the Caribbean context. Um, so I would say recognize that there are other epistemologies, that there are other ways of knowing that it's not just the all of the evidence will not be written. Some of it will be in songs. Some of it will be in um, the, the proverbs and the sayings. Some of it will be in pictures. Some of it will be in the you know in the historical archives, artifacts, and so on. All of it will not be written. That's the first thing. Um, yes, it's true that the colonial archive does not center our ancestors, but I also think that we have our own. Um, you know, University of the West Indies people do uh, incredible work there, and so you might want to want to talk to some folks there who their archives um, in Jamaica, their archives in Barbados. Uh, you may be able to find more. There may be more out there than you realize, and so I would lean into those archives that are there as well. Um, but I also would say, don't just look to writing to recognize other ways, other knowledge systems and to take advantage of those other knowledge systems. To what, one of the things I love about the, doing the research for the Sojourner Truth part of the talk was reading her photographs. And so I love what Imani Perry says that she wanted her beauty recognized. And I think that is true, right? And it's like how she framed herself. I mean, she was no longer a slave, right? But, but she, although she kind of let people get away with kind of framing her like, like as if she was a Southern slave, she also was very careful about her self-presentation in the pictures. And so those pictures really told me a lot about her. That's what she wants me to see. That's what she, how she wants to be seen. Very modest dress but also very well put together, her shawl and, you know, her, her pretty dress and her, it was plain, but she printed it up, the flowers in the vase next to her, that kind of thing. I thought, yeah, you know, I could see that that was important to her. So when Imani Perry says that she wanted to showcase her beauty, she did not want to be seen as a slave. She did not dress like one. She wasn't about to be pictured like one. And she was selling those photographs, saying that she was selling the shadow to um, take care of the substance, right? Selling, meaning selling the, pho the photographs to take care of herself. And the mm -hmm. self 
that she was trying to present to the world was a very well put together sartorially, right? Very well put together sartorially. And, and that was, I think, intentional. I don't, I, don't, I don't credit that to the folks doing the picture taking. I credit that to her. She's the one who got up and got dressed that morning and decided <laughs> this is what I'm wearing, right? And so I think that was very intentional. So I think we have to learn that there are other ways of reading and other forms of text, other texts, so that we're not just limited to what is written in the archives. But I would also say that we have done more work on the archives, right? Um, Post-colonially, <laughs> we have done more work on the archives. So there are lots of people that I can, I can talk to you about this um, privately as well. Tajila, give you some names. So there are, other there are folks who would have more information um, even than I do since I'm not located in the Caribbean um, who can tell you where to go to find work in the Caribbean um, on those archives. And so we can continue this conversation because you and I are in touch. But I want to say thank you. This was absolutely wonderful. What an amazing, um, you know, just individual and speaker and intellectual and poet and just yeah, there's so many things, woman, right, um, <laughs> that you are. And um, I think it all came out today. And I, um, I also just wanted to point out for everyone who couldn't see the the contents of the Q&A. There were so many people who wrote in and thanked you for being a mentor and a role model. Um, just want to say thank you to you and to say thank you to the audience, which is a wonderful, wonderful audience. Thank you for all your work. Thank you for your mentoring of so many people. And thank you for sharing your personal story and these stories of these really profound Black women. Um, and uh, I, I hope everyone who participated today enjoyed this as much as I did. It was so <laughs> inspiring to be sitting here and listening to you. And um, also a little shout out to Natalie for doing our tech today. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that everybody just has a really, really wonderful um, rest of the day. And please keep in mind that we do these Let's Talk About the Humanities twice a semester, and we have more coming up. So please follow the Proctor Institute on Twitter. And again, Aza, thank you. Just like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the Proctor Institute and Rutgers University and to you, Maribeth, and to Natalie. You all have been so awesome to me, and I, I couldn't have done this without this incredible support from both of you and from everyone at the okay. Institute. So thank you so thank much. You. And, and thanks everyone safe. for- Stay safe, Aza. Thank you, I will. I'm, I'm gonna have to go do a little bit more hurricane prep right now. But okay. I wanna say thanks to my wonderful audience. I'm so glad you all came out to hear me and I look forward to reading your comments. Okay, take all care right. everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you.